it just be our thing. <laughs> That would be our, that's our new sync up thing. All right. You just saw that. Anyway, I'm Jim. And I'm Ryan. And this is the Concept Crucible Podcast, episode six. Boom. Six. Six. That's half, half a dozen. dozen. That's freaky. Yeah. That was not rehearsed. We've been doing this for too long, oh, apparently, man. and we haven't been doing it for that long. No. Anyway, um, last podcast we talked about, about inspiration, but today we want to talk about volunteering. Yeah. And specifically, how to be a volunteer, why to volunteer. Uh, some of the volunteering that we've done, um, as opposed to how to manage volunteers, which we'll talk about later. Yeah. Um, so, Icebreaker. Uh, lots of charities and nonprofits use wristbands. I have one. I have one. And, Ryan, what is your wristband for? So, mine's from the KW Community Foundation, and mm -hmm. they have something called RAC, Random Act of Kindness Day. I always think of the monsters from Borderlands. So do I, especially okay. once I started playing heavier to get ready for <laughs> headshots last year. Um <laughs> And full disclosure, I have never participated in the formal RAC activities out in the community. I'm usually at work or somewhere else where I'm not able to get out to where the foundation is. Uh, but why I wear this one in particular, uh, and it wasn't something that I started wearing, it, but it was the reason why I keep wearing it and why I never take it off, is uh, I really do believe in that random act of kindness and the idea of... Um, Paying it forward, and this kind of ties in with volunteering without any expectation of get getting returned. Like yeah. I don't even subscribe to karma uh, that if I do something good, something good will be visited upon me. I just do it uh, so that hopefully when I wear it on my wrist, um, that that one time it will remind me to to do just like go a little bit of extra and do something nice for somebody. So I have you know paid for people's coffee, like strangers' people coffee. You know, like, like here's here's like. 10 bucks or whatever pay for who, however many coffees as opposed to me. strange people's coffee which is when ryan <laughs> buys me coffee yeah i don't drink coffee so it just just little things like that so um it doesn't like i don't always think about it so a lot of times i forget that it's there because i wear it all the time i never take it off mm -hmm. um but you know it just serves as a reminder to that you know you can always be more kind and you can always do kinder things to people around you so and that's ultimately what random act of kindness day is about is just giving us it's like i don't know in some sense it's like valentine's day you can be cynical about valentine's day but at the very least it's one day devoted to recognizing the importance of one particular thing we did a video about that you can find the link over ryan's face so and random act of kindness day is the same thing people will criticize that you should be kind every day and that's the point of it you're supposed to be kind every day however it doesn't hurt to take one day to try to remember yeah. to, to just do this and then maybe it inspires you to do it the rest of the time but anyways, that's me. Jim, what about yours? Yeah, so mine uh, mine says DFTBA. I'll hold it up to the camera on a weird angle. And uh, it is not actually for charity, although the uh, blog, vlog brothers, Hank and John Green, do run the Foundation to Decrease World Suck, which I will, of course, link below, along with Random Fact Kindness Day. But uh, DFTBA is Don't Forget to Be Awesome. I got this when I was in California at VidCon, and I was super nervous and super scared. Uh, it was my first time traveling that far alone, and I was in a foreign country, and I was all by myself, and I had to make new friends and be an extrovert and all kinds of things, and I paid $5 for this bracelet, which seems like a lot, but honestly, best $5 I ever spent, because it just sits on my wrist and reminds me that I should not forget to be awesome, because when I am not awesome, it is not because I am not awesome, it is because I have forgotten, <laughs> and I need to remember. <laughs> and if for more than for more on that, you can go back to our last episode where we talked about art and inspiration because that's what helps us remember. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, volunteering. Uh, I guess we should establish our street cred first mm -hmm. um, in terms of what kind of volunteering we've done and where we where we've done it. We are we are reasonably veteran volunteers, I think, for for men of our age. Yeah. Uh, so, what are some of the places you volunteered? Uh, so historically, I guess I could maybe start historically with yeah. volunteering. Um, so my volunteering experience largely was born out of being involved in youth organizations. So beavers, cubs, a little bit into scouts, and then eventually I got into cadets, and cadets segued into the Duke of Edinburgh Award Program, which I can link to the bottom if you're interested. Um, so in those organizations, whether you realize it at the time uh, or in my case, I realized it heavily after the fact, it is largely built on doing volunteer work. So if you're out planting trees, collecting donations for the poppy funds, 
uh, even when you're out camping, just doing general garbage cleanup and whatnot. It's all built on volunteering. They don't tell you we're going out to volunteer. It's always framed as here's our mission or here's mm-hmm. something we're going to do or we're going to go out and sell these things to raise money, fundraising and whatnot. But ultimately, you're always doing it in, in the spirit mm-hmm. of volunteering. Uh, so I did that from when I was a wee little lad all the way up until, you know, 22, 23 uh, and then once I hit university, I started to pick and choose the things that I got involved with. So heavily in university, I was involved with, um, outside of the philosophy department, that is, the university's um, first aid team. So I got involved with that in my third year, and that extended into grad school. Uh, and then outside of school, I got involved with um, the air show, uh, a cancer support center, uh oh man what else well headshots is has headshots, been, has been yes. a fairly big mm-hmm. one and then uh the most recent one is i joined uh, an ethics board the community research ethics office has a board that does third party reviews of uh, applications for um for st- studies like community-based studies and all we do is we review the study to ensure ethical compliance we don't actually have the power to shut down the the studies but we act as kind of um, a friendly counsel to help people understand what goes in, what what is involved in uh, ethical considerations when it comes to human subjects. Uh, so I've kind of progressed from the basic level grunt work, and now I'm progressing up the ladder, a little bit more responsibility, a little bit more um, obligation on to me. Until finally, I'm on an ethics board, which is um, very much high level kind of volunteering. So yeah, they were you. I never thought about Cubs and, and whatnot as volunteer work, but yeah, I guess my mom's had me volunteering for, for quite a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I got my start sort of, I mean, apart from Cubs and Beavers, which I did when I was very young, mm-hmm. so I'd hardly count it. Um, but when I was about 15, 16, my mom and I started working in cat rescue. Mm. And because we were cat people. We don't have any cats anymore because we have a new apartment and we don't have time for cats. But we did a lot of work. We've had probably a thousand cats <laughs> in the past. Mm-hmm. 15 years that uh yeah i mean we we did a lot of work with feral and semi-social cats and and then we would we would foster them and adopt them out mm. um we work with pet patrol who are super fun and if you're in the in, in waterloo region and looking for a cat they have awesome adorable cats but yeah i mean that that didn't really entail a lot but playing with cats and and sort of being inside my house mm-hmm. uh, so i don't know that i really started volunteering seriously until I guess on campus I was involved with some student societies and whatnot in my last year, mm-hmm. but outside of that, uh, I had I made some really community-oriented friends who helped show me the value of volunteering, and so I spent a lot of time doing it with them. Everything from I, I sat on a couple of committees. I, I volunteered at the same cancer support center as Ryan. Uh, Ryan, I think, was actually the one that recruited me. Uh, no, was, no, it was, it was Michelle, was probably, but it, it, it was, was in Michelle your bar. Brendan, yeah. No, I hadn't met Brendan yet. Oh, we'll okay. do a whole podcast about Brendan. <laughs> we'll get him on for that. That'll be yeah, fun. Yeah, that will be fun. But uh, no, and then from from I went pretty much from there to running headshots, and I've actually I've done a lot less volunteering because I'm now organizing. Hmm. But I am in the in the near future. Hopefully, actually, many of that much of that will be resolved by the time this uh, podcast goes up. Um, I'm looking to serving on a couple of boards, um, one for Quartz Lab and uh, becoming a trustee for the KW Awesome Foundation, helping support local community projects and things like that. Um, because it is, I have been hauling chairs for too long, and I have mm-hmm. grown. I, I love coming down and hauling chairs and helping set up and tear down an event, but sometimes I want more than that, and that is where the uh you know hopefully this is this is the direction it's going to take me but yeah i haven't need to, i'm not the the next level volunteer that you are quite clearly but i don't know about next level but it, it actually it's kind of interesting listening to your story and then reflecting on mine you know as you're telling yours uh we both had a transition it seemed uh coming out of university of now that we're done with our little on-campus environment we turned our eye outwards because yeah. I mean, that's ultimately how you and i really got introduced we were in classes together and i knew you as the guy who had the really weird ethical um, <laughs> oh my God. Uh, case study examples, <laughs> uh, and you had your shaved head and combat pants. Oh, but, long time uh, ago. But one time, uh, just, as a, hair. just as a personal story, uh, one time I asked Jim, you know, like, Jim, you seem to have your finger on the pulse of, of what's going on in the community for events and, and things 
probably largely just a byproduct of being on Twitter, and I wasn't on Twitter at the yep. time. Uh, but uh, so I asked you, you know, like, how do you get involved? And you're like, do you have two hours? Because I'm going to an event right now. And that's when I went <laughs> out and I started meeting people who are more community minded. So once once I kind of uh, I found the same thing happen uh, going from high school to university. Like I was in high school, then eventually I stuck around for a fifth year because in Ontario we had uh, five years and then four years. But I stuck around for a fifth year. But midway during my fifth year, I kind of outgrew the community and I outgrew the high school and I was ready for a bigger pond, went off to university and then, but I stuck on campus for a number of years. And then finally, when I was finishing up, especially in grad school, I outgrew that pond and I was looking for something bigger to sink my teeth into. And I was, I turned my eye towards the community and it wasn't until like I got involved with you, I started working and like just working instead of being a student. Uh, and then through engage and whatnot, just being exposed to the number of charities and nonprofits that my my desire to help out and, and contribute really started to grow. I just want to point out that the end result of this is that we're sitting in my room recording a podcast. I'm wearing a Power Rangers shirt. You're <laughs> sitting on an ethics board wearing a bow tie. Yeah, and I forgot, one of us is winning. I forgot my sonic screwdriver at home. But. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, no, that's that's actually really cool. I did not realize that I had had such a prof- that moment had had such a profound effect. It's it's interesting when you think back to the decisions that lead you to where you are. I mean, for me, going to Kenya was what got me into grad school and doing first aid. But getting into the uh, community, a large part of it was just interacting with you. Oh, and I have no idea what would have happened otherwise. I'm super flattered by that. Oh, I'm, I'm glad. <laughs> touching touching moments on the Concert Crucible <laughs> podcast. We're having feels here. Oh, um. Yeah, one of the other things, but 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 to get away from the feels, because we're a manly man and we do not have feels. We have beards. Yeah, well, we have beards. I actually have more of a beard this week. That's weird. Um, it's the translation. I should shave. Mm-hmm. But uh, is how to be a good volunteer. And this mm-hmm. is something we, we both did the KW Engage program. We've talked about it a couple of times. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a lot, there's a lot of, I, I the, the, sort of there's a lot involved in being a good volunteer. Mm-hmm. And when I say volunteer... Uh, what I mean is is someone that sits on like a committee or below. I mean, if you're hauling chairs for an event, or helping set up, or taking cash, or selling sodas, or 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 manning draw tickets, or something like that, all the way up to you know doing doing planning and mm-hmm. um, organizing fundraising. Once you start organizing your own your own charity events and start managing your own volunteers, at that point, I think you're an organizer, not a volunteer. Yeah, and you are still a volunteer in some sense. Yeah. But. Well, and at that level, there's a whole new level of responsibility oh, and yeah. obligation that goes into it. It, it much more gets demanded of you at the managerial yeah. level than it does at the yeah once you start managing levels. volunteers this is a this is a whole different thing and you, you get at it from a different side and we'll talk about yeah. that um in, in a little while mm-hmm. maybe the end of season one but uh i mean there's a there's a bit in sort of how to be a good volunteer yeah. and my my thing with this is uh, especially with headshots from the heart we we've we I've been managing the volunteers for us for two years now and I'm, we're going to a third and there's sort of a we get there, there's a continuum of volunteers and we tend to get people on one end or the other which is way over here because you can't actually see my other hand because Ryan is super large yeah but I did ask for a super sized co-host <laughs> um no and the, and the continuum relates to supervision you get volunteers that don't need any supervision and you get volunteers that need lots of supervision and i don't think that the people who need who need lots of supervision are bad volunteers no um volunteers are amazing they come out they 90 percent of charity events would not happen without volunteers mm. they are essential um and they are much loved uh, but people the volunteers who need less supervision are definitely better volunteers than mm. volunteers that need more partly because there's already a lot of stuff going on at an event and you only have X amount of attention to spread around. Mm-hmm. And once your command structure gets suitably complicated, things get really complicated. Mm-hmm. But, and so how to be a good volunteer, I think, tends to focus on how to move yourself along that continuum, how to need less and less supervision. That often also means how to take on more responsibility. Mm-hmm. But it can be as simple as being that person who. If it's gonna get, if you say it's gonna get done, it's as good as done. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, or or your word is your bond. Your word is your bond, or or having done slightly more homework. So being being really informed about the event, being able to talk about it with guests or with other people, mm-hmm. um, is always really useful. Mm-hmm. And that's something like we we 
we really push hard on that with headshots because we've got people up in front of the camera and we've got like 16 people coming in and out and they're rattling off auctions and there's a ton of stuff to keep track of. Um, and it can be a real challenge. Ryan can attest to that because he's been doing it for two years running. Well, yeah, definitely. Sitting in front trying to be entertaining <laughs> while keeping everything running oh, smoothly. Yeah. Like, well, actually, I have a perfect example of that. Uh, so the first year you asked me to do headshots, it was largely because I had experience being a karaoke host. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was comfortable standing in front of a room of people. In this case, it would have to be cyberspace who may or may not be intoxicated, much in the way you are at the, not you, but <laughs> people are at the bar. Yeah. Uh, but I had I had a skill set that Jim needed um, for for the hosting side of it. So he asked me to do it because he could rely on me to you know just stick... does have a particular set of skills. I guess so. he will find you. <laughs> he will sing to you. So you just he he figured you know you just sit me down in front of a camera, let let me go. He trusts me to to use the right kind of language and connect with people in a particular kind of way. And then uh, not talk about your penis. Yeah, and not talking about pe penis because it's ultimately a, about. Well, Seriously, it's pretty tough. It's it's awkward because it's about kids and whatnot. You cannot yeah. say bad things on camera for a, 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 a ostensibly a family friendly show. Uh, but the second year that I got involved with it, it. Well, I should say the difference between the first year and the second year. In the first year, <laughs> it's not that we were not family friendly in the second year. No, no. In the first year, I had, I didn't even, I could barely remember the name of the game that they were playing. And I had never played, or uh, I think I maybe watched a little bit of a Let's Play on YouTube. Uh, but I had absolutely zero experience in uh, talking about the game, Borderlands. So in the second year, I made it my mission that I would at least play through some of Borderlands 2, because that's the game that they played in the second year. Uh, and so I did my homework, and I got comfortable with the game. I mean, I only played it through with one character, so I can only speak of, you know... Like it shows, the, though. The Gunzerker, yeah. So that afforded me to uh, be able to have hosts who had no experience with it and still be able to carry on meaningful conversations with them. So, I mean, really, that taking the responsibility to educate myself just on a, a video game to be able to do my job better when took me from just, like, an average volunteer or an average person standing in front of a camera to a much more competent, easy-flowing person. I mean, I'm not the best person to host, uh, but I know personally when I actually did my homework, it paid off a lot. So that's a, a, a tangential uh, explanation of why you should do your homework. Now, so the other thing... Um... And you had touched on this earlier. Is I, 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 I call it having a clear vision, mm -hmm. um, but you, you refer to it as, as knowing what you're trying to get out of it. And mm -hmm. both of these, I think, are the same, or they're intertwined. Mm -hmm. okay, one of the things I do with headshots is and all of our volunteers, I tell them, know why you're here. Have a story that you can tell. Find out what your story is, because that narrative is going to help you connect with everyone who's here and with the audience. But, and at some point... I will come and ask you because I really want to know why you're here with us instead of at home watching television. Mm -hmm. And that answer can be as, as profound as, you know, people who've had, um, you know, experiences being in the hospital or, or with their children in the hospital, mm -hmm. but it can be as simple as they're trying to develop themselves either professionally or, or, you know, um, get their community service hours. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, this might this might sound a little controversial. At least I prefaced it when I was pitching mm -hmm. the idea to you. But some people might have a, a problem with the idea that um, whenever you volunteer, you're getting something out of it. And I think like to be a good volunteer, at least to to really set yourself out from other people when you're volunteering, you really should be getting something out of the experience. Uh, whether it is something that actually benefits you, like for example. Uh, I work at a college here in town and I would not have gotten that job had not I had the volunteer experience from one of the organizations that I volunteered with because uh, I demonstrated over a two year period. I was taking a lot of minutes, um, organizing committees, take, uh, keeping ca uh, track of documents, uh, event planning and whatnot. So that experience, unpaid experience, is still experience nonetheless. Oh, yeah. And that's really what helped me to get my, my job at the college. Uh, so, I mean, you can go into a volunteer experience and, with the intent on getting something out of it. Um, I mean, obviously, you're not going to get paid for it. The definition of volunteer usually yeah. includes no money, or at least no monetary gain. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you can't advance yourself professionally, 
or you can't um, get some sort of recognition out of it. So um, references or um, per professional reputation can come mm -hmm. out of it. Um, or you can go all the way down to what people usually think about volunteering and you can uh, do it before the warm fuzzies. Uh, there's something to be said about feeling good about volunteering. Um, and that's something that you don't get in paid work. And there Actually, is some psych studies about that. I have the opposite of that. Oh, yeah? I mean, not the opposite of that in that, you know, <laughs> you I... feel hate. I feel nothing but hatred and bitterness while I am helping children. <laughs> no. Um, I talk about it... I, cold uh, scratchies. That'd be the opposite <laughs> of warm fuzzies. I get the cold scratchies. No, I, I, I don't. But I get the warm fuzzies like every other human being. Yeah. But <laughs> I... Um... I also have I call it I call it the crash. I think I wrote a post on it a few years ago, mm. um, coming out of headshots, and it's that notion that I mean headshots. We spend twenty four hours. I'm up for the whole thing. We spend twenty four hours, sort of going through and doing everything and 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 making it happen and and doing good works, and it's super energetic and super stressful, but at the same time it, it is so wonderful. Mm -hmm. But coming down from that takes me like two weeks. Because I, I, like, on the Monday, after we've done everything, after we've torn everything down, we've done all our wrap up. I go back to my job, and I love my job. But there is a mo there there are like every minute is dominated by me thinking that nothing I do in the next sixty seconds will be as meaningful as the things that I did this weekend. Mm -hmm. And and that that feeling persists for about a week. Mm -hmm. That I just I and I, I feel terrible because I'm like I could what I want to do is just do is just do headshots full time, which I know that I don't really want. No, I mean I love it, but it's I could never do it full time. That's madness. No, or as soon as it becomes like work work. Exactly, yeah. as soon as it becomes work work and stops being about helping people, it would stop being being fun. It would right. stop being warm and fuzzy, but also mm -hmm. it would just drive me insane. Um, but even then dur during the, the event, I get, I get the warm fuzzies. And when I think about the event, we just spent the past weekend editing footage from last year's event. And I am reminded of all the great things that happened there. Hmm. And it makes me feel really good that we managed to, to accomplish all these things. But I never look forward to that crash. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, it's so draining. I mean, the warm fuzzies ultimately come from the juxtaposition of, you know, like, it's almost like when I I climbed, a, I tried to climb a, a mountain in uh, Alberta and failed, but then I climbed a mountain in uh, Kenya back in 2007 and succeeded. I, all, I made it all the way up to the peak of Mount Kenya. Um, so, yeah, like, the... The, the juxtaposition afterwards of, you know, I'm, I'm coming from this place where I accomplished this or mm. met this goal or reached this end. And then now I'm back in civilization. Yeah, you know, it's, 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 the, it's the fairy tale mentality mm. is, that, is that, you know, I, I, have come, I have come home now and everything is normal again. And so, but normal is somewhat more dissatisfying than it was. Campbell's uh, Hero's Journey. Yeah. Uh, we should link if you don't know anything about that. We should link that. In the we'll link that in the in, in, in the DVD. Reading. Oh yeah, that's required. Good reading times for Star Wars at the very least. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I mean, I guess the, the 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 last question is just why. I mean, why do it? I don't know that I that either of us is in a position to say why you should volunteer, mm -hmm. but hopefully, I mean, I I think that you should volunteer. No, I. Agree. I think that it will be better for you. I think that you will have fun. You will meet people and have experiences that you've never had before, mm -hmm. and these are all good things for human beings to have, mm -hmm. but. Um, I don't think that I am in a position to provide reasons for a random human, but I think if we share ours, mm -hmm. you, they might resonate with you. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually, uh, during our pre-work, I said three things, but I think I'm going to add a fourth one to it. Oh my God, breaking the Holy Trinity. I, I know, I know. Normally I group everything's in the threes. I like prime numbers like that. Um, oh yeah, so, four is the first non-prime. Yeah. Well, one is not a prime. It doesn't True. count. But anyways, uh, so the, the thing that I'm going to add to it is, um, <laughs> the defense, the eternal defense of humanities and whatnot is it opens you up to experiences that you wouldn't have had and it makes you, uh, I don't want to say it makes you a better... So does meth. So, it does. <laughs> it does. Helps you run cities and whatnot. And crack. Um, no, I, it opens you up to experiences that you wouldn't have normally had 
but it it's it's kind of like the human condition thing where it just it gives you a greater perspective on things it's it's similar to uh arguments why you should travel um it just it opens you Makes up sense. to those things and allows you to broaden your horizons see new things that you wouldn't have normally seen and it challenges you uh, and I think challenging your worldview is ultimately a good thing. It makes you a better person, assuming you constructively meet those challenges. I mean, if it's not good for you to meet a challenge and then it reaffirms your your biases, like you know, yep, no, the, this thing is bad, and I knew it was bad instead of overcoming it in a constructive way. Um, so I I say that's that's what I would tack on. But uh, going back to to the Trinity though, there are really three reasons why I volunteer and. Uh, they range from pragmatic to uh, super fuzzy. Um, the pragmatic is, as I said before, it, you can de professionally develop from it. It does give you concrete skills. Um, as a piece of advice, you know, coming out of university and whatnot, when you don't have a degree that readily lends itself to, you know, high-paying jobs, what everybody wants, especially in STEM, uh, one way to help you is to, to buttress that with volunteer experience. Yep. Uh, it has to be intentional volunteer experience, or at least you have to learn how to how to connect the dots and, and write the story. You can't just say that I volunteered for five years, you know, doing something. I don't I don't I don't want to disparage anybody who who does you know menial volunteer positions because it's all important. Um, but you, you can't just say you know I was I was doing this. You have to. Yeah, it's not just about time served. Yeah, you have to show you have to show kind of intentionality behind it. I did this because of this. Yeah. Um, so if you can stitch it together and if you can demonstrate the concrete skills that you got out of it, like organization, but more than organization, taking minutes, distribution of of documents, uh, managing volunteers. If you can show that you've done that, then that really helps you out, and that shows that you've been willing to do these things without being paid to do it. Yeah. It, it does reflect positively on your character. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a very pragmatic reason why to volunteer and why I volunteer. Um, but the second one... Uh, I'm going to steal your second one, actually. Because your second one is my first one. The loyalty one? Yeah. yeah. I A lot of the time, that was how I started volunteering, yeah. was my friends were running charity events, or they were involved with charity events, and I wanted to help out because they're my friends. Mm -hmm. And that was, I mean, that was how I wound up in, in, and again, that's a lot of what I started doing was hauling chairs, you know, set up, tear down, um, entertainment. Mm -hmm. I've done a lot of volunteer entertainment. I play, play music. I do juggling. I do magic. Um, and I used to do that sort of all over town whenever I could. And I, 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 I really want to get back into that. I've sort of fallen off my game with making videos and doing everything else. But I really miss like, just hanging out for a couple hours and playing guitar for kids. Mm hmm or telling stories, or, mm -hmm. you know, doing whatever. But that that was a big part of it for me, was just, I was there because my friends asked me. And I wanted to find a deeper reason than that, and sometimes, I mean, I can usually find one. But the first reason was just because someone I care about needs me to do this. They need someone to do this, and I'm here, and I have I have an option. I can say no, mm -hmm. knowing that... You know, all I'm really going to do with that evening is play video games or, you know, do a bit of writing or something. Mm -hmm. Or I can go and contribute to something that has a meaningful effect on people's lives. Mm -hmm. Or helping people that you care about reach their goals. Yes. Well, like, I mean, that, 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 that I would, I, 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 I think you're right to, to separate that, but I would also say that, mm -hmm. that is, that is part of having a meaningful effect on people's lives. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, no, I don't think I'd have anything else to add. It's yeah, just, no, that totally just curbed yeah, your second point there. A, a friend asks you, and you simply go and respond. You answer the call. Yeah, you know that's that's really my second. Reason. It's like helping people move. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, moving. I could do a whole episode about moving. I love talking about moving. I did a video about moving a little while ago. You can find it over Ryan's face. But it's that idea that moving, move, volunteer work is like moving in that it is often very demanding. I like like one sort of one night event volunteer work is often pretty demanding physically but it is how you find out who your real friends are mm -hmm. because no one no one really wants to go out of their way to do physically demanding things in the same way that no one really wants to help people move everyone hates moving but everyone needs friends to do it mm -hmm. you cannot do it by yourself you can but it is a lonely and horrible endeavor 
Or you can only do it when you're a student moving out of one residence yeah. room into the next. <laughs> you know, you can do it because you don't own any real stuff. Yeah, yeah, I've done that plenty of times. <laughs> right? Moving. What out do you have? I have a futon and a and a hard drive full of MP3s. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess it's it's more poignant in your case because you're not a, like there's no allure for you when somebody drops a case of beer and says you want to help me move. It's true. Yeah, I like, don't drink. That, that would work with me. It's like you know, hey, can you help me move for a couple hours? I got a case of beer. Everything's already boxed up. Which, by the way, if you're ever gonna ask somebody to help you move, box you, your stuff up. You better have it all packed, all ready, and so that all they have to do is walk in and pick up the boxes and move. That is like the worst sin when you ask your friends to help you move and you don't have everything packed. So shame on you. Get it packed. But anyways, yes, case of beer, drop it down. Want to help me move? Boom. Yeah, and that, no. wouldn't, that wouldn't work. I mean, well, you. I work for pizza, but I mean, really, I I, I do it. I always remember um, a couple of friends of mine, Ryan, who, other Ryan, who mm-hmm. does uh, TBK with me. Mm-hmm. Uh, he uh, he was moving one day. He was moving in with his uh, girlfriend now, fiance. Um, and they texted me, and I I just gotten um, a new thingy in, in my phone, and so I didn't have her number. So it was just like, hey, can you come and help me move? And I went, sure. Who is this? <laughs> but my in, my inclination was to say, yeah. Like, mm-hmm. like obviously, if they have my number, they're probably either a wrong number or a friend of mine. Mm-hmm. And it's it's more likely they're a friend of mine. And I didn't really have anything much planned that day. So, mm-hmm. of course, I will come and help them move. Um, you know, that is my first inclination, even before figuring out who it is. Mm-hmm. Which I think partly speaks to my character, but at the same time... I don't want to brag about it because I don't like bragging about things that speak to my character. <laughs> that that is the limit of my humility right there. Anyway, what was your what was your fourth reason? You had four reasons. Yeah, so the third of the Trinity or the fourth in total. Um, I think we've broken up Trinity at this point. Once you add a fourth, <sighs> it's Trinity plus one. Great. Anyways, it's since how Catholicism got started. I guess so. Yeah. It's uh, Trinity plus. Well, especially if the Trinity is not three discrete parts, but actually. Oh, God no no we're not doing a Catholicism episode not right. now. Uh, anyway, so the third reason, it's a little bit harder to pin down, uh, in a concise way. Uh, the nearest I can get to it is, um, altruism makes me feel good, but ultimately it fulfills me. I guess fulfills is probably the, the most concise way to say it is, um, you volunteer for something because you're fulfilled by it. Um, you don't necessarily have to volunteer for the fulfillment, uh, because you can find fulfillment in your actual paid work. You can find fulfillment at home. Uh, you can find fulfillment in your hobbies. But, uh, for example, I used to volunteer with the, the first aid team on campus. And I volunteer with them almost to the exclusion of my schoolwork. And at the same time, I was the president of the Philosophy Society. Uh, not to say I neglected them. Just to say that CRT came before everything yeah. else. And I, uh, When I left CRT, I probably had the record, but we didn't actually keep formal records of this but i had like 800 something volunteer hours wow. registered that was and that was formal that was meetings training and uh a few uh, and my shifts like yeah. taking first aid shifts that didn't include all of the prep work that didn't include going to conferences that didn't include uh doing extra remedial like giving extra remedial help to people who needed it to brush up on their skills or the research involved in, in advancing the team so all of those things didn't all include into my official tally. My official tally was strictly shift work, meetings, and training. Uh, and I had over 800 hours, and that was and I did that was 800 hours among uh, two and a half consecutive years, and then one term afterwards. Wow. Uh, so I mean, I I threw myself into it, and I found it I found it incredibly fulfilling to the point now where I mean. CRT was what informed ultimately my my thesis topic Mm -hmm. on doing the ethics of first aid and I'm I guess if I say it on the internet I'm gonna have to follow through on it but I think that in the next few years I'm gonna transition over and go to paramedicine school um I I I just I'm you can break your internet promise I guess I I can I guess we can just take the video down and nobody will know (laughs) otherwise no uh we're gonna edit that part out but uh no I I'm not gonna retroactively edit out your broken promises (laughs) Uh, but I just, I just, I felt so fulfilled by the work, both on the leadership side of it. So having to, to, uh, cause I was one of the co-leaders of the team, the co-coordinators, and I did that for four straight terms, which, uh, in that current time frame had been unprecedented. Nobody else had run the team 
uh, no one no one single person had been a co uh, coordinator for four straight terms. Um, the team has been around for over a decade, but before I joined, roughly the 2008 period, I don't know if anything like that had happened before. But in the modern incarnation, it had never happened. So I will add one to your Trinity Plus. Yeah. Um, probably the the most obvious one, which is you should volunteer if you feel a deep connection to the cause. Mm. I mean, whether it's like we do headshots work for Child's Play, mm -hmm. um, which helps kids in, in children's hospitals and domestic violence shelters. We I've done work with the homeless um, because I've spent a lot of time being at risk. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there there's everyone has their their cause, their thing that makes them sit up and pay attention and empathize with people. And if that is your thing, like you, once you find it, you can find opportunities for that. Hmm. And I mean, part of that I think unpacks into fulfillment, but but more it it is it, less about sort of the personal fulfillment and more about uh, fulfilling the needs of other people. Like for my mom, it's it's cats, hmm. and that was like the lion's share of her her volunteer work and governance is in um, rescuing and working with uh, feral cats. Hmm. And you know, there's a lot to be to be said for for finding the thing you care about. Um, because that, I think, more than anything, will will help you commit to it. It will help you work hard at it, and, it, and you and you will ultimately do better at it. Because you are, if you're just in it for professional development, I am going to say disparaging things about people who are just in it for professional development. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that if that is the extent of it, I actually I can't fault you that much, but I think that you would be better off. And I think that people who who do I have I have done volunteering specifically for professional development. I am one of the people that I am describing. I have to confess to that. Mm -hmm. But I know d from doing it that I would have been at better off if I had also been doing something I cared really deeply about. Mm -hmm. And th I mean that was that was a volunteer commitment that I eventually let go because of, because you know I just couldn't I couldn't prioritize it properly and I didn't feel like it was giving the I was giving it the attention it deserved. Um, because I wasn't as committed to it as I was other things. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you're in it, for, even if you're in it for professional development, find something you care about and do that. Because then you can get two birds with one stone, because you can get the fulfillment and the helping people you care about and the uh, professional development. And that is two birds plus. And just no, a trinity. Just, <laughs> just don't do it. Don't do it to be to get the title or to to be able fun. to say, yeah. We know lots of people who get involved with things just to say or to put it on their CV or whatever. I mean, I guess you're volunteering, but I, I don't mean, know those people. Well, we we know a few people who make the the circles but don't actually do any work. But uh, we did not start this podcast to, sp to say disparaging things about people. No, that's why um, I won't say their names. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, but we will <laughs> see you guys in a couple of weeks. Yep. I'm Jim. And I'm Ryan. And we're going to sign off. Stay awesome. <laughs>